Welcome to today's workshop on preparing for drought and managing water sources. Before we get into the workshop itself, I'll just take you through the program for today. We'll um, first of all have a bit of an introduction to the uh, to the workshop, um, which is just a bit of housekeeping that we've already done. Um, that we um, will we'll do the questions at the end. This workshop's been uh, presented by the Nursery and Garden Industry Queensland using funding from the Queensland Government and the Farm Water Futures Project. Um, Farm Water Futures Project is a project that assists growers with improving their water use efficiency. And um, today's program will be, uh, we'll have Kerry Battersby from NGIQ talking about disaster preparedness project and um, how to prepare for drought. Then we'll have Eric Smith from the Centre for Agricultural Engineering talking about evaporation, mitigation and storages. We'll then have a bit of a, um, a, a break, um, go off and make a cup of coffee, we can hang around and we can uh, talk a bit more about some of the things we've already talked about in the workshop. Then after the break we'll have Ben Walsh from um, Bioremedy talking about um, dam water quality and then uh, we'll have a bit of a wrap up at the end where you can ask other questions and um, let us know um, any, any way that we can help you. Okay, so if there's no more questions, um, I'll hand over to Kerry. So Kerry can start screen sharing now. Um, so if you can share your screen, Kerry. So some of you may already know Kerry in her previous role as the Executive Office of her NGIQ. Um, after finishing up, finishing up in that role, um, Kerry moved into the disaster, um, into the disaster resilience role. Uh, after we had a couple of severe weather events in Queensland um, in recent years, and she's now involved with a national project, which Kerry's going to tell, talk to you about in her presentation. So um, Kerry's going to be talking about how to prepare for drought and some of the things you need to do to reduce your risk of loss from drought events. So it's all yours, Kerry. Thanks, Lex. So can everyone see the screen okay? Now, in this presentation, it's really an introduction to what Eric and Ben will be looking at and letting you know what NGIQ is, is working on as well. So in this presentation, we're going to be looking at the current drought situation in Queensland, what your responsibility is for your nursery property, any assistance that may or may not be available, and most importantly, offer some guidelines to help you manage the risk of drought. But let's firstly look at what is drought. Now drought is a prolonged, abnormally dry period when the amount of available water is insufficient to meet our normal use. Drought is not simply low rainfall. If it was, most of Australia most of the time would be in perpetual drought. But it's generally difficult to compare one drought to another, since each drought differs in, in its seasonality, location, spatial extent and the duration of the associated deficiencies in rainfall. Additionally, each drought can be accompanied by varying temperatures and soil moisture deficits. So let's look at what the response is from, especially from the Queensland Government to drought and how they consider it. So drought is considered a normal feature of the Queensland environment. I don't know if you um, realise that. It's a normal feature of our environment. Producers must factor the regular occurrence of major droughts into their future business management plans. And we, that's something we're going to come back to in this presentation future business management plans. And on occasion, conditions may become severe enough to threaten viability of a production nursery. So let's look at the current situation in Queensland. So this map shows that 67.4% of Queensland council regions are, drought, are still drought declared. And this is a map from the 1st of May. So the dark pink uh, indicates it's fully declared. So that, that whole shire, that whole council area is fully declared. And you can see that that 
encompasses um, almost all of the southeast and southwest region of the state. The light pink indicate partial declarations for council areas, and the white um, is where uh, the drought declaration has been removed. So um, you'll see, you know, the northern areas around Mareeba and inland through um, Charters Towers and even out to Mount Isa and, and beyond west, that's no longer in drought. So interesting map, especially for nurseries, which are mostly coastal. And so we've still got serious concerns in that southeast and the southwest uh, region of the state. Now this map, if you want more information on this, this map can be found on a website called Long Paddock. So you've got the website address there. And the Long Paddock website is actually a really useful site for information about drought conditions and historical rainfall maps. That's the um, homepage for Long Paddock and you can see from the tabs across the top that there's um, quite a bit of information in there and that's um, freely available and it's been developed by um, Department of Agriculture here in Queensland. So I strongly recommend you have a look at that and some of the tools and resources that they have there. Now you've also got on the Long Paddock website access to the series of um, posters which you can download. You can also order for, if you want something to pin up on the wall, you can order these and get a um, quite a large size poster. So they do a range of posters on rainfall variability and you can get that from um, 1890s through to present time. So again, a really good, useful resource there. And I think you can also flick through on a, um, on a screen there to see um, online what the um, different seasons are and what uh, the weather patterns have done over the past century and a half since, since records were available. Another good side, of course, is BOM. The um, Bureau of Meteorology um, has drought resources. There's a heap of information and we'd recommend you have a look at this particular website. So if you type in and look at, type in, in the search function for drought, you'll actually see this page will come up with drought. You can look at weekly rainfall, um, impact on drought for um, seasonal conditions, rainfall tracker and a definition of what drought is. So really helpful tools there. But let's get back into what we're dealing with at the moment. So Queensland government drought policy is based on the concept of self-reliance. So let's think about what that means. Primary producers, and that includes you, should therefore adopt a risk management strategy to minimize the impact of drought on their enterprise. So if we go, if we recall that drought is a normal feature of our environment, um, we've got self-reliance added here. So just keep that in mind. We've got to be self-reliant when we're in a season of drought. Now it's recognized, of course, that prolonged and severe events such as the one we're in at the moment may be beyond the ability of many producers and nursery owners to cope with this financially and physically. So there are a series of state and federal government subsidies, grant and loan programs available to assist in these tough times. There's subsidies on transport of fodder and water for livestock during drought and returning from adjustment and the restocking in recovery period. But there's a, a crucial difference between the sustenance of livestock and keeping a, a, a crop alive through um, a, an orchard, or, um, or, or a seasonal crop versus day-to-day -day production. So the current key program by the Queensland Government is called the Drought Relief Assistance Scheme. There's more information on this on the DAF website. Um, and if you want more information, I suggest you look there or have a chat to myself or Lex after that. Um, but the problem we have for nurseries is that these subsidies and rebates are okay if you're running cattle, but as a nursery owner, if you run out of water or if you're located in that bright pink zone of a drought declaration map, what do you do? What's available to you? What's in it for you? To be honest, at the moment, there's not much. So what they do have 
and I'll show you on the next slide, but I'll just point you to another website where they actually list a drought preparation checklist. That's under the um, Department of uh, Small Business and Enterprise, business.qld.gov.au. If you want a copy of the um, drought preparation checklist, um, we're happy to send it to you or you can download it there. Let's have a look at the information that's available on the Department of Agriculture website. There's a lot of information there um, and very happy for you to go through that at your leisure. Um, but as I said, at the moment, there's not a lot that's available specifically for production nurseries. But certainly it's good for you to be aware of what's there and what you can and can't do. Um, and just check your own status in terms of drought declaration. So let's look at the concept of self-reliance. Where do you start? When do you start? When do you start to plan for a drought? And at what point do you start? Now self-reliance, every nursery I've been to has a dog. So there's Shadow. He's a dog that's not looking too happy at the moment. He's in the middle of a dam that's totally dry. So how's he gonna be self-reliant? How's he gonna get water? How are you gonna get water? So are you going to be able to start on this process by yourself? And at what point can you start this process to change? And I think attending this webinar today is um, going to give you some fresh insights into some of the technologies that are available. Um, through the presentations by Eric and uh, Ben. But let's look at the general overall picture for you and your nursery. Let's assess your ability to adapt, change processes, refresh and restore business operations. But what can you tolerate? Think about your own situation. What can you tolerate? What's the minimal amount of rainfall you need each year to maintain a certain rate of production to make you viable. Now, if you've tested this threshold this past summer, and most of us have, then you'll have some idea of your tolerance level. Or if you've reached that, oh, what am I gonna do next week? How long before you need to cut your production levels before you run out of water? So know your tolerance for disruption. Now at NGIQ, we're working with nurseries to identify their risk for impact by a natural disaster such as a flood or cyclone or indeed low rainfall. If this slide looks a little bit foreign to you, that's okay. You might need to consider a risk assessment of your business. But if you've got this sort of arrangement and you've done a risk analysis or a business impact assessment of your um, capacity, but something has changed recently, like you've purchased another site or perhaps you've expanded the business, it's worthwhile undertaking a, a new risk assessment. And if you participate in EcoHort, then um, the annual audit that Lex does for you also includes risk assessment questions. But if you have a look at this page, this is a risk analysis with, with legends and segments. And the next page is a risk matrix, which I'll show you, but have a look at some of the um, consequences of some of the items on the left hand side and then you match it to the likelihood of an event so is it likely that we're going to get minus seven in Stanthorpe next in the next couple of days it's probably up into the three or four or five range likelihood of an event therefore what are the consequences on the business so you can actually match drought and um, a natural disaster event along this risk legend and segment. Let's have a look at the risk matrix on the next page. So what can you tolerate? So this is a matching of consequence and likelihood. And when you identify the high risk extreme situations, they're the ones in the top right hand corner that obviously is in red for you to take action almost um, as, as a top priority. So again, as I said, if you're not familiar with this type of risk assessment, 
um, let us know, put something in the chat box and we can um, help you after uh, this webinar. So let's look at you specifically. What can you tolerate? I'll go back to that question. Let's apply it to you. Know your risk. What's the likelihood of running dry? What's your worst case scenario? Have you actually confronted that already this year? Do you need to shut down for a season, a fortnight, or can you actually modify production? What's your primary water source and what's your secondary water source? You need to know what you need. You know, know what your capacity is and know what your usage is every single day. Now, how long can you last if the water supply runs dry or fails? What's your plan B? What happens to suppliers, customers and staff if plan A fails? What practices can you change to improve the odds? But is this a gamble or is it actually a planned risk management strategy? So while you contemplate these questions, let me give you a bit of background for the um, levy funded Horde Innovation Project that NGRQ is currently working on. So the project objective for this is, uh, and we've listed the title of the project down in the bottom left. The objective is to determine the potential for natural disasters to impact the Australian production nursery industry. Um, we are looking at everything from cyclones, bushfires, frost, hail, um, and, uh, and everything in between. We've developed a risk map for the um, entire production nursery across the country. And we've also matched um, nurseries up with a national database provided by a company called Risk Frontiers. And it is an address-based example whereby, and if you have a look at this example, we uh, have access to a national database that's often used by insurance uh, uh, agencies that look at site-specific hazards and can match that to your particular address. Now, this example here is for bushfire rating. Now, we have a, several nurseries. There's probably over 400 nurseries across Australia that are, have a hazard rating of five for bushfire. Now, how is that interpreted? That means they're within a distance of 100 metres from extensive bushland. So what we're doing is working with them to see, to build a recovery plan if in the event of a bushfire or, or indeed an ember attack. So the things we look at, pretty practical, and you'll be familiar with all of these. So these are the things that you need to think about to keep your business successful and which forms the template of our project's recovery plan. You need to, of course, consider stock, irrigation, biosecurity, customers, suppliers, industry, government uh, requirements from you, infrastructure such as shade houses, sheds, your own home and the garage if you live on site. You've got to think about the chemicals, fertilizers, growing media, business, family, staff, the well-being of all of those, plus also pets. As I said, if you've got Shadow on site, he wants some water and some looking after, and if he's going to be spooked by a bushfire or a flood, you need to take care of Shadow. And of course, you've got the equipment and vehicles. So there's a lot to think about just on a daily basis when you're running a production nursery, let alone be impacted by drought or a natural disaster. But certainly got to hand it to this industry because what we're finding is that you are some of the most innovative opportunistic and optimistic people we've ever met. You see, create, you create opportunity out of loss and you display mateship to help each other out and you go through some tough times, but always think that someone's worse off than you. It's a credit to you. So these are some of the comments that have come across to us in the last uh, 18 months with some of the natural disasters that have impacted Queensland. I can manage. It's all right, we've been through this before. Very Aussie, she'll be right. 
there's always someone worse off than me. Don't worry about me, I can manage. There's always someone worse off. And after the uh, Townsville floods of early 2019, one of the producers there said, no book's been written for this one. Never been through anything like that before. So how do you manage your risk for drought and for natural disasters? So let's finish off with these questions. Know your risk. In season of drought, what's the likelihood of you running dry? What is your worst case scenario? What practices can you change to improve the odds? And is this a gamble? Is this all going to stay in, in your head and not be written down? Or are you going to develop a planned risk management strategy? So these are questions for you to contemplate over the next um, hour and a half as we talk through these issues. And of course, you can always contact me or Lex at the end. And wouldn't it be nice to have a, a fantastic um, summer season this year with, with plenty of rain, not too many floods, but it'd be nice to see all the nursery dogs very happy puddling around in the water of the dams. Lex, um, over to you for any questions. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Kerry. Um, I think what we might do is, um, if you've got any questions, um, just turn your microphone on and ask it that way rather than go through the group chat. We don't have a lot of people here, so that's um, probably the easiest way to do that. Um, so I'll throw the floor open to any questions that anyone might have. Okay, so I might um, ask you a question, Kerry. You put a slide up there that had um, risk hazard ratings for all sorts of different um, catastrophes, but there was nothing in there about drought. Is that something that, that's going to be considered in that project? The, that's based on the uh, national database for um, address risk. So every single address in Australia has a risk rating, and that's what your insurance is based on. So we've been, um, we've subscribed to the service to obtain that for the nurseries. Drought is not included in that. Um, and it, drought at the moment is not considered a natural disaster. There's a lot of talk, however, at both federal level and state government level to get this back into recognition as a natural disaster. It used to be there, um, but Currently, it's not, and um, there's a big push from both the um, Prime Minister and the national, the, you might have seen the federal um, government set up a national drought and flood agency earlier this year. It um, stemmed out of the, uh, what's called NQ Lira, which was the North Queensland Livestock Agency, which was set up after the 2019 floods through um, North Queensland and far North Queensland. Um, there's a lot of work happening now to make drought a natural disaster, which gives it a whole, um, opens it up to a whole scope of um, federal assistance. But at the moment, not drought, no, not in terms of, of drought. If someone wanted to develop the um, look at their risk hazard, they don't really have to do something from scratch. For their particular situation there's no template that they can follow at the moment no and that the, not in terms of drought but what we can do is work with them so um for the pro for the national project what we're starting to do is we've we've identified a cluster of nurseries that are um, meet a certain set of criteria they've either been impacted or they're at high risk of bushfire or hail for instance um, and uh, we've got myself and Barry Naylor and a consultant um, by the name of Lloyd Russell, who is who are working intensely on this project to develop recovery plans for each of those perils that we face. So um, project runs for another 18 months. So we'll have, if you keep a look on um, the NGIQ website, but also the Horde Innovation, Your Levy at Work newsletter, if you don't already get that. Um, please subscribe to it and you, you can keep up to date via Horde Innovation on the um, project or you can call us. 
Um, so who would be able, who, who can growers talk to to um, find out about writing a risk management plan? So welcome for you to, to give us a call if you've got interest in, in developing that. If it's um, totally foreign to you, perhaps talk to your accountant. Um, if you've got a bank loan or something like that and you've got a good relationship with your bank manager, have a talk to them. Um, there's a lot of uh, financial planners out there that can also develop it for you. Um, but if you want to just have a chat to us, we're, we're probably happy to help you as well. Um, just like accounting fees, it will cost you to develop a plan, but um, well worthwhile. And keep in mind what we said at the start of the presentation is Queensland Government is looking at self-reliance and the push is for every single primary producer to have an individual business risk management plan. So I might as well get in early and, um, and get yours sorted. So what you're saying there is the best time to prepare a uh, risk management plan is now um, like every natural disaster you always got to prepare beforehand and that's why with this national project we're looking at the key risks for the for the industry but also for individual producers so if you know your risks and you know your seasonal um, uh, hazards then uh, it's it's easier to prepare in good seasons than it is when you're going through it so, and as, as a consultant, Lloyd says, um, you know, everyone needs a good season policy. Yep. Yeah, um, it's a bit like the old saying goes about when's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago, <laughs> second best time to plant a tree now. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Same principle. Okay. Um, so do we have any more questions for anyone? Okay, I might um, hand over to Eric now. So if you could uh, set yourself up there, Eric, um, get your presentation up on screen, I'll just do a bit of an introduction here. So um, Eric um, Smith from the Centre for Agricultural Engineering at the University of Southern Queensland. So the um, CAE has run a project investigating losses from farm storages, um, they focused um, on large storages such, such as the cotton industry storages, um, but much of the work that they've done is relevant to any size um, storage. So Eric's going to be discussing some of the results from his work and how these results can be applied to the nursery situation. So it's all over to you now, Eric. Thank you, uh, Lex, and I hope you can see my screen with my presentation loaded now. Um, storage evaporation mitigation strategy. So it's really good to. Uh, have this uh, discussion this afternoon to share some information with you. Um, our group have been involved in, uh, in evaporation saving strategies for uh, many years now, probably close to 20 years. And uh, Queensland government uh, recently approached us to a little bit of an, uh, do a bit of an update in terms of what are the, uh, the current technologies that are available uh, to industries to save evaporation losses. Uh, so that was one part of our exercise, our project, is to do a technical review, but also to talk to manufacturers and users to get an idea on their, um, on their successes, adoption, challenges, and, and then to make some recommendations because ultimately it'd be useful to have some demonstrations uh, of some of these products on, on typical industry storages to actually do some case studies and, and look at the uh, viability of these products. Another part of that, that study that... Uh, Queensland government have asked us to do is to develop a, uh, an evaporation ready reckoner. And so uh, we're progressing this very well at the moment. It's one of these topics that are very topical during or after a drought. Um, and, um, but when the floods or the rains come, people tend to, to forget the importance of saving evaporation water from storages. Now, uh, the, certainly the nursery industry, it's no different uh, for your sector. Um, some information I got from uh, the uh, Australia Bureau of Statistics, 2017-18. Uh, that gives the uh, value of the uh, production of nursery, cut flower and turf industries combined. And uh, 265 million and, and, and a very large amount of that, 85% is in fact uh, through irrigation, irrig irrigated production. So very much reliance on, reliant on water. 
And uh, you know, anecdotally, more than 70% of, of the production nurseries have some form of on-site water storages. So managing that water is a key part of your enterprise operations. The majority of, uh, of storages in nursery industry are, are quite small. By that, probably less than 10 megalitres. Now, a megalitre is uh, 1,000 cubic metres. So if you would look at it in, in the size of a, of a typical storage, you know, 50 metres by 50 metres, four metres deep, that would give you a 10 megalitre storage, uh, maybe 0.25 hectares in area. You know, in the, uh, in the cotton industry, most of the storages are better, bigger than 50 hectares. But uh, even certainly in your industry, there's a, a wide variety of scales that need to be addressed in terms of uh, evaporation. Um, as we've heard um, already from, from Kerry, water security is essential in your industry. And uh, your production, you know, for every unit of water you use is very, very high. So no doubt it's, uh, it's critical to, uh, to save that last uh, megalitre of water to put it to good productive use. Question would be, you know, how, how big is the problem uh, across Queensland? Uh, how many storages are there um, in Queensland? And we, we collected data from uh, the Queensland government uh, database. And uh, this has been shown graphically uh, on this page. The, the map on the right just gives a, a sort of a salt and pepper effect of, of different storages that have been picked up from uh, the satellite images and, and aerial photographs of different sizes. Uh, and uh, more usefully, I guess, on the left is a uh, bar chart, which shows that uh, if you added them all up, more than 240,000 storages uh, in, in Queensland of very varying size, as shown by the color codes there. And the majority of them would be less than one hectare. So a large number of very small storages, but a number of very large storages, which actually, when you look at those storages, are 100, above 100 hectares, although there are very few of them, they, they account for a large amount of evaporation. And I guess in the catchments that the nursery industry is most impacted by, you know, your uh, Brisbane uh, catchment, Mary catchment, Gold Coast, that, uh, that trend is, is, is true. Large number of, of relatively small storages uh, with the potential to lose evaporation. Uh, how much evaporation? Yeah, what are the losses? And, and again, this, this map gives a nice uh, indication of how evaporation changes from fairly low at the coast, increasing as you go inland from about 1700 millimetres, 1 1.7 metres, up to about 3 metres, 3000 millimetres as you move inland, and certainly increasing as you go north as well, driven by temperature, driven by, driven by cloud, and uh, driven by wind. And so again, for, for catchments like, uh, like the Gold Coast, anything between 1700 millimetres and almost two metres. If you go up uh, to the Sunshine Coast, Mary uh, River catchment from 1800 to, to just over 2000 millimetres. So that's a lot of water that could be saved. You know, two metres of water lost off the top of your dam is a significant amount of water to worry about. Um, what can you do about it? Well, there are a range of different uh, technologies, and I'll come back to each of these and talk briefly to them. But this diagram really shows the sort of the, uh, the portfolio of options you've got. One would be, number one, just to change the shape of your, of your dam. Make it deeper. Uh, give it a, a smaller surface area per unit of volume stored. Split it into two cells would be an option. Or put a cover over it, a suspended continuous cover number two, which is uh, suspended above uh, the, the dam, a typically shade cloth. Or you can float something on it. It might be a continuous cover covering the entire dam, or it might be broken up into modules, smaller floating disks or floating panels of, uh, of plastic. Uh, obviously, uh, photovoltaic uh, power generation using modular floating cells is something which is of interest these days. But that's more around power generation than evaporation mitigation. But certainly people are using that as an option. And then lastly, the opportunity to use some chemical covers, uh, which can be applied to the water uh, whenever you need it. So I'm just going to touch on each of these uh, briefly. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. Uh, we can pick up some questions later on, on on some specifics. But probably the most cost effective is to change the shape and deepen your dam or splitting it into cells. And if you can then manage your water into that storage to ensure that you've reduced the, um, 
surface area to volume ratio by pumping water into a small storage and keeping that full rather than keeping two storages half empty. That's a, a really good option, which landowners are familiar with because they can move earthwork, they can use earthworks and um, they, they can handle that quite easily internally. It's a one-off upfront cost and uh, sometimes planting uh, some trees perpendicular to the prevailing wind close to the storage also helps shading and reduce wind speed and therefore reduces evaporation. But be careful of the roots. If you've got roots at the edge of the dam, they will certainly like to drink some water as well. Um, a busy slide with a, a, a fair bit of detail, which I won't, I won't try to focus on all of it, but I just wanted to highlight the fact that um, each of these products have their own pros and cons. So in this case, I'm talking about a suspended continuous cover, i.e. a cover which is above the water. In fact, this bottom picture here is looking from underneath the, uh, the cover at water level, and you can see the suppression of sunlight. Um, the size of that storage that could be uh, suitably addressed with that product is quite variable, but typically you wouldn't go more than 15 hectares, and anything more than five hectares, you'd have to put some internal um, supports to, uh, to suspend the structure. It provides a very good uh, reduction in evaporation potential, up to 90%, depending on the fabric that is used. And there's a number of other benefits, you know, including reducing algae, reduced impact on, uh, on temperature, reducing temperature, which has some water quality benefits. Uh, you'll appreciate that there's uh, construction challenges there, so you'd need very uh, qualified contractors to do the job. It lasts a fairly long time, uh, 15 years for the cloth typically, 30 years for the structure. So it would be a, a good solution for a long-term uh, scenario. The price is quite variable, $9 a square meter to $30 a square meter uh, in terms of the capital cost. And that's depending on where you are. It depends on the size of the structure, on the, the design and the configuration. But certainly, uh, and those in the Stanthorpe area will be very familiar with this type of product above um, orchards for, sh for um, protection of hail and wind and the like. And uh, many have used that now for evaporation. The second uh, and third uh, classes I wanted to talk about was floating covers. And these could either be what would be called continuous. The top, uh, the top uh, um, photograph shows a continuous cover which would cover the entire storage. Whereas as you move down, you get them broken into different panels of different sizes, all the way down to small modular systems. It might be a disc of about, you know, 300 meters across. Again, they all have their pros and cons. Typically here, uh, the area is quite limited to which you could be uh, uh, using for these types of products, especially a, a, a continuous cover. It will be less than two hectares. But when you go to modular systems, that might be able to go to a slightly bigger area. Very good evaporation saving potential, up to 90% and, and more, depending on the, the percentage of the dam, which is actually covered. It will limit access to the water by different, uh, by, for stock, for instance, and, 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 and other requirements to get access to the water, which in some cases is, is a challenge. Uh, if it's a continuous cover, cover, it would need to be tethered or buried or, or anchored to the bank, whereas the floating uh, covers, which are modular, can simply float in the middle of the storage and they can be moved around if the storage starts to empty to cover the portion of storage which is holding water. 15 to 25 year life, so they've uh, been shown to last fairly well. And uh, price, again, is, is quite variable. Uh, again, depending on... Uh, on where you are, the product you, you use. But typically from 15 to $30 a square meter for the floating continuous covers and slightly more for the, for the modular systems. I'll move on to the next slide. And again, we can come back and talk in more detail about each of these uh, later as required. The molecular films are, uh, have quite an appeal in the sense that they, they don't have a structural limitation. You can apply them to a much larger area you know, less than 100 hectares, one would argue, if you could apply them uh, remotely from a number of applicators. And there's a picture at the bottom there of a, of, a, of a remote applicator where the product can be applied at different parts of the storage dam. And probably less than 10, 10 hectares if you're applying it by hand. The, the, production, the reduction of evaporation is highly variable using these products. Less than 
fifty percent or seventy percent, and and uh, and it's unknown to be honest, and, and uncertain in in real practical situations. So to some extent, the uh, more science is needed to actually develop these products, or certainly evaluate how well they are they are performing. They are generally water quality friendly. They are bi biodegradable. They've had tests done in terms of their water quality approvals, and uh, they're food grade based, so they don't have a water quality impact. Um, the cost is really much dependent on how much you put of the product, what it costs per liter or per kilogram, and uh, how frequently you apply it. And that's the one great advantage of the system. You only put it on when you want to, i.e. In, in the peak summer months potentially, and you don't have to have a huge capital outlay. Um, the last one was really uh, modular floating cells, and that's an area of, of, of great interest now. And uh, obviously, as I said earlier on, the, the use of these systems is more around you know, looking at a good place to put your PV system out of the way, off the land, where you might want to put some other productive enterprise. Um, it pro provides an advantage of cooling off your panels, uh, but clearly the cost and the design would need to be uh, substantial to ensure that uh, you get the continuous and safe PV generation. Um, in summary of those uh, products, then the floating covers would typically be applied to very small storages. So in the nursery industry, floating covers would, would, uh, would be very much uh, potentially viable, you know, up to five hectares. Uh, the susp suspended covers, you would typically go up to about 15 hectares and chemical covers could arguably go bigger than that. But you'd have to look at fairly advanced application strategies uh, when you get to the, uh, to the larger storage storages. So in the nursery industry, because you're operating probably around smaller storages, you have a whole range of options in terms of products. And all of those generic types of product I've mentioned, they all have commercial suppliers who are in business, uh, who have been in business for some time, and uh, who are able to provide a solution. There are barriers to adoption. You know, if there weren't barriers to adoption, we would see these, uh, these systems deployed across uh, much larger areas. Uh, one of the barriers is the, is the financial one. You know, how much uh, is it going to cost up front and do I have the cash flow to generate uh, that, that investment? Um, and you really need to look at that investment over the life of the product and compare that investment to what you're going to do with the water saved, i.e. what is that water worth to me? What is the market value of the water? So the lifetime cost of that product is quite critical. And, and I think that's one of the great failings. This has not been well demonstrated to different industries and is something that needs to be done. But there are technical barriers too, in terms of how well is that product from a technical strength point of view? Does it get damaged by storms, by wind, by hail? Um, what is the lifespan of that technology? And, uh, and in some products, you know, how well does it perform? And particularly those chemical barriers, they, they, it's not really well understood how they perform. But also the variability of climate. You know, if, if my dam is empty a lot of the time, is it worth my investing something to save water? If I have prolonged droughts, is it worth investing? Uh, do if I don't have a guaranteed water supply, would I invest in a, in a product that's um, not necessarily gonna suit me all years? And there are other barriers about, you know, is there co-funding I can get from, from government, co-investment? And, and what is the risk of the water I save being used by others um, if I you know, get a co-investment from, from, from government. If I'm an early adopter, am I, uh, am I exposed to, to, to new technologies? Um, just to uh, look at uh, the last sort of element of the talk I wanted to highlight, it's really a question of the economics. I think that's the key driver. Uh, it's about knowing what is the, uh, the cost of that technology for me. And by that, I mean, what is the lifetime cost of that technology? And in the, uh, in the blue box, uh, we've really highlighted the fact that you want to look at what is the capital cost, what is the life of that product, is it 10 years or 20 years, you know, what does it cost for me to maintain it, to operate it, to repair it, and of course, does it save me you know, 90%, 50%, do I have a high evaporation of 3 meters or 2 meters or 1 meter, and what is that number, and how do I then compare that with the value of water, the second bullet point, what is the value of that additional crop that can be produced. What is the value of the water I have to buy in from my water supplier? Maybe it's $1.49 a, a, a cubic meter, $1,400 um, a megaliter. And so we've done in our study, which is still being finalized, we've looked at things uh, like this, whereby for a particular 
type of cover. This is a suspended continuous cover like a shade cloth for various capital costs, $9, $13, $30 a square meter for different locations from low evaporation in Stanthorpe up to high evaporation in Mount Isa. And you typically find that along our coastal nursery production areas would be similar to Gatton. How that price dollars per megaliter water saved will increase. When your capital price is low, um, your price will be from $400 to $500, $570 a megaliter. Whereas if that capital price went up to $30, that would be $1,400 and more per megaliter. So there's different price points depending on how you operate the storage as well as the capital costs of, of the storage. Um, and that's just a, a snapshot of the importance of doing these sorts of calculations on a site-specific basis. The, an important one for me is how much is that water worth to you? And it'd be interesting maybe during discussion to find out from the production uh, nursery operators, what is water worth for you? Uh, and if you look at it, just jumping ahead, yeah. If you look at it in terms of uh, what can you produce with that water per unit of water, there's some interesting data that's available from the Queensland government. And I've given the, uh, the link to their uh, Ag Margins uh, website. That's from QDAF, where they've uh, provided the information on uh, the, uh, the gross margin per megaliter for different crops. Now, unfortunately, nursery is not there, but you might see that for, uh, for cotton, for instance, it's from about $556. I'm talking of a median price here, uh, all the way um, uh, from, from 159 in certain years when the price is very low and the yields are low, all the way up to $1,000 in years when the price is high and the yield is high. But certainly other industries like horticulture, uh, you're gonna have a much higher value uh, of production, gross margin per megaliter of water used. And, and I would expect in nursery, that would also be very high. But again, if, if you might look to compare it against you know, how much you're paying for your water to buy it in. So uh, interesting uh, to do that economics and uh, the Ready Reckoner we're developing will provide you to, uh, an opportunity to do this at your site for any particular product, for your evaporation, for your way of operating the storage dam, for your um, quote you might have for a particular product and get a, a, a dollar per megaliter cost of that product lifetime and be able to compare it to your productivity information. So just to close then, um, the, uh, the main factor limiting uptake, uh, we believe from our discussions with suppliers and users is really a better understanding of cost benefit. And uh, we're hoping to do some, some um, case studies uh, to, to demonstrate that for a range of industries. It's really important that some demonstration trial sites, point number two, uh, are, are done where we can monitor the performance and we can have open days and people can come and look at how the product is performing, some of the practical considerations. Um, the other important thing is that uh, is to look at the, uh, how much it can actually secure in additional water and what's the quality of the, meat, the water that can be saved because many of these products in fact improve the quality of the water by lowering the temperature, cutting down sunshine, improve the, a reduction in algae. There are a range of barriers to adoption I've, I've mentioned, um, and, uh, but I think uh, with uh, demonstration, we hope that there can be a better understanding of the potential, one potential uh, way of addressing your drought uh, considerations that Kerry uh, mentioned earlier on. I think the final point I'd make is that it's really important to look at the whole of enterprise water efficiency. I've just looked at the storage dam, I've looked at the uh, evaporation mitigation, but you, know, you don't want to be saving water in your dam and not actually uh, scheduling your water well in terms of timing when you apply it or how you apply it with your application efficiency or the extent to which you, you can recycle your water and you're capturing recycled water. And the water quality aspects, which we'll hear about in a moment, it's, it's one, one part of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of an opportunity to save water uh, across your, your production enterprise. So thank you, uh, Lex. I'll, uh, I'll call it quits there and uh, happy to pick up uh, discussions and questions. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, Eric. That was um, very concise uh, look into the evaporation mitigation side of things. Um, so um, has anyone got any questions for Eric or comments that you'd like to make about using evaporation mitigation strategies? Eric, it's Steve Hart here. Um, just a question about the suspended continuous covers. 
and your 50, you know, 50 to 90 percent reduction on evaporation. Um, what different fabrics are, are used? I imagine shade cloth is the predominant fabric, but mm. yeah, shade cloth is the only uh, product that's um, that I'm aware of that's used locally, uh, Steve, and uh, and that's uh, there's different uh, woven versions of that, different uh, densities. Uh, for the one that they typically use for uh, evaporation mitigation, it's got a 95% uh, density or UV incident reduction. And um, we, we haven't done any tests ourselves on how much evaporation that would reduce. Uh, but uh, in earlier tests we did of a, of a product which had an 85% uh, um, UV reduction rating, we were finding it saved 70% of water evaporation. So we would expect with a new uh, cover that they're providing, it would uh, be able to give up, up above 80% evaporation mitigation. And um, so that's a uh, the sort of performance that we would expect from that, uh, that, that system, uh, Steve. And Eric, does it make a big difference about um, the height of that shade um, protection cover above the, the actual water level? Not really. Um, some of some of them are constructed a level with the bank. So if it's a fairly small span, uh, they can they can span it level with with the bank. In other cases where it's they, they're trying to span a greater distance, 100 meters or so, they would have it elevated with uh, with a, a trellising system to be able to have cabling to hold it um, at, a, at with a greater tension. Um, the, the the impact of height above the water, I don't think, would be um, significant. Um, most of them would be, uh, you know, when the, when the top water level is full in the storage, that, that'd probably only be a metre to a metre and a half above uh, the water level. Then, of course, when the water level falls off, um, your, your, your gap would increase. But the, the, the staving of, of, uh, of evaporation is mainly through the uh, reduction of wind, and the re reduction of, of light incidence, and the, the, to some extent the um, holding in of the, uh, the, 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 the moist air under the cover. And that wouldn't um, change marginally um, with, with different heights. So I wouldn't anticipate that's a major issue, uh, Steve. Thanks, Eric. Okay. Um, you um, mentioned in some of the statistics there that something like 85% of, of businesses that you um, that we've got information on have irrigation well i think for the nursery industry that'd be pretty close to 100 percent, if not 100 percent mm. um the other the other thing um that people might like to think about is that we're saving water off the two meters off the two meters of water off the top of the dam the thing is that that's where the largest amount of the storage is in the dam um so if you can save that that two meters it's, it's it, it could be up to 50 percent of the volume of the dam that you're losing um in evaporation across a year so there can be some pretty substantial numbers yes and i think it's uh, it's also about uh the water you save is often the last uh, last resort water so when one talks about what's that water to worth to me it's about you know what how valuable is that water when i've got nothing else now, if you can buy it in at a reasonable price from your, your urban water supplier, and maybe that's again $1,400 a, uh, a megalitre, that's probably what you would, you would do. But in many cases where you don't have access to that, you've got to look at the, the, the value of that water in terms of you know, losing your stock and, um, or losing the quality of your, of your stock in your production, which, which is, affects your price point. So I think that's part of your, your risk. Uh, management is to say, you know, how much is that water worth to me? But not just on average, what's it worth to me if I've got nothing else? And therefore, uh, what am I prepared to do to uh, to save that water? Or what can I do to buy an extra water? What are my options? I mean, in Stanthorpe at the moment, they've been trucking water from halfway between Warwick and Stanthorpe at an enormous price. And, um, you know, those in Spring Creek can probably guide us on that. But, uh, you know, and, you know, what is my, uh, what is my, uh, my enterprise uh, worth to me? And, and, and it's also a case of not just, uh, oh, I'll carry all my storages. If I've got more of them, it might be saying, I'll, I will cover one of them, which is my most important water. And I'll transfer water from others, other areas into this, uh, this particular storage where I, uh, I, I put most of my effort. Okay, um, so have we got any more questions from, or comments from anyone? 
Yeah, Lex, I was just going to uh, add to that um, on the uh, the value of the water. We're, we're seriously looking at covering all our, our dams. We're starting with our small ones and working our way up um, because you're right, once you have to put it into a truck, uh, people talk about $1,400 being expensive. Um, you know, we were paying up to $30,000 to finish off the year last year. So, yeah, that, but again, it was just to finish the job. It wasn't, uh, you wouldn't start an enterprise at that cost but it was to finish off the season. So it becomes very expensive towards the end. Mm -hmm. So um, that was a great uh, topic um, where it's been very relevant at the moment, at the moment with what we're doing at the nursery here. Well, we're, we're hoping that, um, that there'll be an opportunity uh, to be able to uh, engage with um, industries such as yours, as well as suppliers of these products to uh, set up some demonstration sites. So, uh, you know, depending on uh, Queensland government and how they're wanting to, to continue this work, there may be an opportunity to reach out to the nursery industry and yourselves to say, look, can we find some sites where uh, we can, um, you know, have a product installed um, and, um, um, you know, and look at doing some detailed monitoring of, of your experiences and the water savings and the economics, develop some case studies. So, uh, you know, if it gets to that point, and we'd like to think so, we'd certainly come talking to the uh, nursery industry and, uh, and and looking at some some potential for that. Yeah, thanks, Eric. We um, we'll actually have a couple of um, systems in place by probably the end of this year. Uh, we're building a new um, ring tank, so it'll be a, a soil. Uh, it is fifty by fifty by three. Um, it'll be lined, and then we will we have a suspended net over the top. Oops. So we're hoping to have that completed by sort of summer. Um, uh, all going well, and then we'll have a few smaller dams and spring holes that we're looking at uh, covering with different um, systems. So I'd be keen to actually know like those those discs. I don't know who in Australia actually supplies them. I don't know whether you have any contact details. Well, they can be sent to us at a later date. Um, be yeah, there are, there are. I can certainly send you some details on that. There are a number of suppliers. The discs are, are probably the one where there's been greatest market failure. Uh, if you go back uh, eight years. There were probably nine or 10 of those different disc type products available. I could give you a number of names, but I won't uh, at this point. But um, of them, only two are available at the moment. Uh, they tend to have a quite a high price point. Um, they very much targeted um, um, at, well, agriculture, but certainly also in water treatment and in, in, in wastewater management because they, they cut out, out all of the, uh, the sunlight and uh, they help minimize the impact of, of water quality um, and so on. So there are a number of mines and wastewater treatment works that, that use them. So there are two suppliers I can share with you uh, who, who pro currently provide that. There are some, uh, some challenges there about, around um, you know, size limitations, but I think in terms of nursery operations, they'd certainly work. And again, what I refer to as those continuous floating plastic covers, What's happening now is they've been maybe cut down into modules of could be 50 meters by 50 meters or 10 meters by 10 meters. So it could be customized to size. And I think that's a quite a nice way as well, whereby it's not dug into the embankment uh, itself, but it's floating. It can be with, removed by ropes, depending on the size of your storage, 50 by 50 meters, not too bad. It can be removed for safekeeping when the dam is dry. It can be deployed without too much drama. And it is also a very viable, uh, viable system. So I'm, I'm happy to share, you know, s some of the names of companies who, who we've been engaged with, who um, are in the market at the moment. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. So in terms of that um, project that you talk about um, with uh, Eric, that you um, that you're going to be uh, running, um, <clears throat> and you're interested in getting nurseries on board, probably the easiest way. If people are interested in getting involved in that project is to contact NGIQ and then we can pass the details on to you. That will be fine. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I'd just like to delve a bit more into what people think about the relevance of this sort of work to the nursery situation. Um, the interest that the people that people are showing in in putting evaporation mitigation in into place just doesn't seem to be there from, from my experience and i wonder if anyone's got any comments on why that might be 
Lex, just quickly before I go, um, for us, it's water quality. We're not especially worried because it is cooler here in Stanthorpe. Um, we're trying to um, improve our water quality before it then goes up through our filtration systems. So that predominantly, where evaporation is not our biggest issue, but water quality is. Okay, and um, also the topic about dollars per megalitre gross margins. Um, I had a talk with Eric um, Bryant at the workshop about um, about those sorts of figures for the nursery industry and that table that um, Eric showed of the, the gross margins for different industries. Um, my, my estimate would be that the sorts of figures we're talking about more likely to be the blueberry example rather than any of the other uh, industries, even horticulture, but I don't believe that there's um, any information out there. I wonder whether any of our growers here have um, those sorts of things considered about how to go about in those fields. Yeah, I'd be very interested to uh, to hear if there is some information available on uh, on the uh, the gross margin per megalitre of water, because as I said, the the work the information we we get access to from the Queensland government's website, Ag Margins, doesn't have any uh, nursery uh, products, and I have asked around a bit, obviously, and uh, it doesn't seem to be um, much available on that. And I guess it's highly variable and dependent on the, uh, the, on the particular industry, the, the particular part of the nursery industry you're talking about. Uh, but it would be useful to, to, to get some handle on those, on those numbers. It may be one of those things that each individual business has got to do because the nursery industry is such a diverse industry, yeah. everywhere from growing vegetables, seedlings, up to um, semi-advanced and advanced stock in ground. So every situation is going to be different. They're going to be sourcing the from different sources. Um, some are going to be using um, maybe water directly from an irrigation scheme, so evaporation isn't an issue for them, or they might be um, storing all of the water in tanks, so that's uh, much less of a covered tank, so that's not no issue there. But um, it, I really think it probably comes down to um, each situation um, to, to work it out for themselves. Um, is there, are there any resources available that would guide people in how you're breaking up a little bit there, Lex. So you're asking for resources on for which for what? Um, resources to so people can um, calculate their own gross margins. Um, that's a good one. Um, I I I think um, it's really. Uh, I would imagine the nursery is the best place to start in terms of the nursery industry. Should I say? where they have uh, information collated on uh, different production levels of different crops, pricing points, um, input costs, and so on. I know cotton industry, I know horticulture, Growcom have got some, some useful information on that, and the sugar industry have got information. And I'm, I'm not sure where nursery would collate that data, but um, I, I suspect that that's, um, that would have to come from the industry itself, which is you know, NGI, Q or NGIA, uh, but I think the point you make is probably very valid. It's very variable and it's very seasonally driven as well. You know, what is a good year? What is a bad year? And so that's uh, something you want to play with. And the, the Ready Reckoner, the Economic Ready Reckoner, which I've mentioned already when it's available, will allow you to actually then not calculate your gross margin, but certainly look at the cost of the product over the lifetime in terms of water value. And then uh, you can play around with your own books about what's my water worth to me uh, compared with buying more water in or compared with uh, or, you know, what I can produce with that water. And that can provide you a very personalized assessment. So we hope to have that calculator finished in, in, in August, end of August, and we will uh, communicate with uh, NGIQ and, and maybe you can, you can release that uh, link uh, Lex to, uh, to the, um, your, your, your participants to give them access to that. But yeah, in terms of the gross margin, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. So I'd be um, happy to do that. Um, there is currently a project um, that I'm not involved with, and I don't know very much about it, that is gathering those sort of statistics, I believe, for the nursery industry across Australia. Um, I don't know, Kerry, do you know um, what that project specifically is and what sort of information is coming out of it? Yeah, Lex, I was thinking about hoard innovation with this and um, uh, it, it may well be that we need a, 
to put up a separate project to collect this specific information. The, there's a, a national project for statistics, but I think it's related more to um, production and business size data. Um, so I'm not aware of anything that's doing this specifically, but again, you know, cotton, as Eric's indicated, cotton, um, sugar and uh, horticulture is, is ahead of us in this. And certainly take your point, Lex, that it will be uh, a variable depending on what production type we're looking at for, for nurseries. And I think that's probably been the sticking point in the past to actually get that sort of data. But I think with the work that Eric's doing at USQ, there's certainly the opportunity for us to look at a um, future pilot project um, potentially funded through Hort Innovation. Yeah, um, I was sort of wondered a bit, a bit like what you said in your presentation about there's, there's not a lot of um, outside support for the, the drought funding for nursery businesses. Um, the same could perhaps be said about gathering statistics, uh, financial statistics for businesses coming back to them having to do, do it themselves so give them an idea of how they go about gathering that information for the business so they can work those numbers out. You're on mute, Alex. <laughs> one, more, one more comment that I'd make about um, something, uh, the point that, that Eric brought up was that um, today we're only talking about very specific things to do with drought. There's a lot of other things that have come in that you can manage your water supplies. So you need to look at the whole system um, considerations. So your irrigation scheduling with your recycling, um, seepage out of the dam that's not something that we've talked about here but this is also a project that's been um, looked at in previous times um, and particularly with um, it was a case study done in the nursery industry um, so yeah I think you, you need to not just focus on a few things for the whole system so when you start thinking the risk management with the whole system where am I, where am I, where am I doing well um, so that you can then focus on those areas that you can get the, uh, the, the best um, result from. Hmm. So um, thanks Eric for that um, insight into, into uh, evaporation. Um, look forward to seeing what happens with, with the project um, down the track. Mm. I was going to have a virtual coffee break here. If people want to go off and um, have a bit of a break, you um, can do that or you can hang around and we can chat about um, you know, any other topics that people might want to talk about before we get into uh, Ben's present. Or we can just continue on if, um, if that's the way that people want to go. I'm happy to continue, Lex. Yeah, I'd be happy to keep going, Lex, if that's possible. Same with me. Thanks, Lex. Okay, well, the consensus seems to be that we'll um, keep moving on. So um, our next presenter is um, Ben Walsh from BioRemedy. Um, so BioRemedy are a Queensland company who provide a range of products, chemical, biological and physical, as well as... Um, technical advice to assist in managing water quality and water storage. So, um, Ben, if you can um, start sharing your presentation, um, we'll um, have a look at the, the things that people can do to uh, help to manage their water quality and their storage. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
How's that, Lex? Have we got that working? We've got your presentation up as a slideshow. There we go. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, you know, discuss some options uh, for managing water quality and with with a with a focus on on drought um, as as this webinar um, is based around that and and the importance of um, you know I guess having a proactive approach on on firstly you know looking at water quality uh, from a holistic point of view um, and just how important it is uh, in those uh, times of uh, drought uh, when it's very critical. So uh, water is one of our most valuable resources um, and for an industry like uh, nurseries um, it is, is quite important obviously without water uh, it becomes almost impossible to grow plants. So I just wanted to get um, as I said, yeah, people thinking about uh, a proactive approach to, to water quality and, and realising that it is critical to, to maintain good water quality before it's too late. Uh, there are many times where uh, we have, you know, people get in touch with us and, and it's, it's at a point where, um, you know, the, the, the person possibly has, has an issue and, and that's why they are, they are contacting us. Um, my focus is really trying to, to get people to, to take that proactive approach and put things in place that uh, maintain a, a higher level of water quality to avoid the, you know, the catastrophe of, of a reduction in water quality in particular uh, through the summer periods and, and, in, and in drought situations. So there are a number of things that happen uh, during during drought and, and just in general with water quality uh, in drought conditions and, and these are, are prevalent through summer also. Um, so dissolved oxygen is, is a critical component that becomes decreased. Um, we see increased temperatures, the increased potential for evaporation uh, and, and stratification. Um, we also uh, see an increase in the uh, processing of nutrients and organic matter, um, the productivity of cyanobacterial blooms, so algal blooms, and, and, and also floating and submerged weeds dramatically increases also. And then uh, lastly there, uh, the production of odours, uh, particularly uh, through summer, um, become prevalent. So yeah, as I was saying, plant and crop production are, are completely reliant on water and, and the focus I wanted to sort of make here is, is um, getting people thinking proactively about the management of their water quality um, as early intervention strategies uh, can save time and money. So we, we do uh, focus uh, a lot of the time on, on the now and uh, and sometimes that's too late. Uh, so if we can change our or shift our focus to uh, that proactive management approach, then potentially you know there are some some time and and dollar savings there. So for the nursery industry, um, some critical components with regards to water quality include dissolved oxygen, uh, thermal stratification. A sludge or organic accumulation, excessive nutrients, suspended solids, and some general uh, water quality components like hardness and pH. So, guys that work in the nursery industry would be aware of some of the common problems that are associated with a reduction in water quality, and that is, uh, you know pretty significant algal blooms, um, you know, blocking of filters, foot valves, um, disinfection equipment, 
So basically all the irrigation components require greater maintenance and, and that can often affect production. So aquatic plants and algae, uh, this is a, a very uh, common theme that we see you know, throughout Southeast Queensland is, is algal blooms that can have dramatic impacts on water chemistry. Um, this, so basically what happens is we see fluctuations in dissolved oxygen and carbon dioxide during the bloom. So during the bloom, algae uh, remove carbon dioxide during photosynthesis and that raises the pH uh, by increasing the level of hydroxide. Uh, so why that is important in a nursery situation is uh, it can impact the effect in effectiveness of chlorine disinfection. So essentially uh, you need to, to, to dose more chlorine the higher the pH is to get the same result. So a methodology approach that, that our business follows and recommends uh, is basically adding oxygen is the first component uh, and combining that with circulation works very uh, works very well. Um, and then uh, the third component is the biological enhancement. So using uh, a, a biological additive to to assist with improving water quality uh, is is our approach. So by introducing oxygen, we're trying to break the anaerobic cycle uh, and the related conditions. So um, during uh, anaerobic, I'll just jump back to this slide here, uh, the top right, uh, some of the uh, implications of stratification. And we see what happens during this is uh, we have high levels of oxygen at the surface and the temperature is obviously greater at the surface. And then as we move through the water column, the oxygen becomes uh, decreased. And as a result of that, um, we see things like iron, manganese and hydrogen sulphide production in the bottom sediment. Um, and also things like uh, ammonia and, and phosphorus increasing. Uh, so, so by um, putting in place mechanisms to either add oxygen and break that anaerobic cycle in the bottom sediment, uh, we prevent those um, metals being released from the sediment and also some of those gases being uh, released also. So, um, and this sort of falls in line with our uh, circulation um, mitigation options. So by putting in place uh, circulating devices, uh, we create consistency through through the water column um, and uh, we mix that uh, highly oxygenated warmer water with the, the cooler uh, low oxygen water at the bottom. Jump back. Um, so when we look at oxygen or, or aeration using mechanical devices, there are there are you know numerous uh, systems out there that, uh, that that do the same thing. I've, I've been to a lot of nurseries and, and you know, they're very in, intuitive and, uh, you know, sometimes utilise, uh, you know, existing infrastructure to try and add oxygen or move the water around in dam, in the dam. So um, whilst that uh, certainly would be benefiting some way, uh, there are, I guess, more efficient or effective ways at, at introducing oxygen. And that's uh, primarily uh, with a subsurface aspiration type unit, um, which, which produces a, a small bubble. So the bubble size really matters when we look at oxygen and, and how much uh, oxygen is being transferred into the water to try and uh, remove that anaerobic uh, decomposition of the, the, the bottom uh, material. So, uh, yeah, bubble size is extremely important. Um, so, to get a very efficient oxygen transfer, we need a, a very small bubble or a micronized bubble. And when combined with a uh, 
circulation underwater or a, a propulsion distribution underwater, it, it, it provides a very efficient oxygen transfer rate. So I have a video here of uh, one of our units that, that does that exact thing. And as you can see, it's combining both uh, the oxygen injection with, uh, with circulation. So it, it combining those two components allows us to, to have a high uh, oxygen transfer rate. Uh, this particular unit is designed for use in aquaculture. Uh, so it also has a, a, a very economical to run, I guess, compared to, to some you know decent sized pumps that, that you may be operating. Uh, it's got a 1.1 kilowatt motor. Um, so our second uh, mitigation option or, or, or solution for trying to improve water quality is the introduction of circulation. Um, so uh, when we look at larger storages, uh, generally speaking, um, we see them quite uh, you know, deep and, uh, and that's where we potentially see that thermal layering or stratification occurring and uh, putting in place some circulation mechanisms can uh, bring back that consistency through the water column with regards to temperature and oxygen. And that just benefits the overall ecology of the, the, the storage um, and, and reverts us back to a, an aerobic cycle. So we're really utilizing uh, the surface area of the dam to, um, as the, the, so relying on the atmosphere to transfer oxygen to the water and then using the circulating device to, to mix that through the entire water column. So by creating horizontal flow and, and mixing the oxygenated surface water with the pond bottom, it allows that aerobic respiration and de-strap to take place. So yeah, the final uh, component of uh, you know an, an approach to improve water quality uh, is to induce uh, introduce biological uh, bacteria, so beneficial bacteria. Um, again, there are um, you know quite a number of different products um, out there that, that generally do the same thing. Probably a lot are the same uh, species of bacteria. Um, but essentially, when combining uh, oxygen and, and the introduction of the, the ben beneficial bacteria, we uh, overall improve results um, regarding water quality. So uh, generally speaking, uh, things like nitrogen, uh, phosphorus to an extent, but uh, degrading um, a lot of the organic material that accumulates in, in uh, nursery uh, storages, uh, yeah, it's certainly beneficial. So something else uh, very important, I think, to consider is, uh, you know, considering uh, water storages and, and how to manage, uh, you know, that resource is uh, promoting effective drainage at the nursery and, uh, and, and considering reuse of the, the water through, through runoff. Um, and I know NGIQ have some, some, uh, some papers on their website that I found uh, very useful um, with regards to uh, floating wetlands and constructed wetlands uh, to try and uh, firstly capture some of the, the, the solid or sediment um, th from the runoff and also strip some of the, the nutrients that would be entering, uh, entering the storage. And I'm sure Lex will be able to point you in the right direction uh, with regards to those papers. So another another uh, pretty important component to water storage is the use of um, uh, things like bore bore water. Um, we found um, generally, you know, uh, the, the bore water quality can vary from site to site and, and often uh, can be quite high in dissolved minerals, um, in particular like dissolved salts. 
and uh, and and also things like iron, uh, which can can also uh, cause issues. Now uh, that may be an option to um, utilise, uh, you know, a percentage of bore water and mix it with your with your main storage, um, just to just to, as a sort of top up type scenario. Um, and then obviously rainwater harvesting collection systems can uh, can be extremely beneficial and uh, implementing evaporation mitigation solutions is obviously you know something worth considering so so that's me uh, sure if you have any questions Yeah. Ben, it's Steve Hart here. I'm just asking okay. about, um, I, I know you suggest an integrated approach using oxygen and, and um, yep. circulation and biologicals works best, but usually growers kind of go like, I've got a limited amount of dollars to spend, yep. and what's going to give me the best bang for my buck? Am I going to be better off to oxygenate the water or yeah. try and de-stratify it or, or how does that go? And does that yep. change with drought conditions and varying you know water levels in a dam so so uh, like oxygen is probably the the most critical component so adding oxygen um but i guess we, we would need to consider the the size the shape the, the overall volume of, of the dam before we sort of make a consideration there um because it gets to a point where um you know say above 10 megalitres uh the amount of oxygen uh, that you can sort of input with a with one device, uh, so so the benefit outweighs um, you know the, the, the cost. I guess uh, you would need a significant number of units to, to get enough oxygen to see some benefit. Um, so that's where we may consider the use of uh, like a, a larger circulating device to to move the water rather than uh, than than inject oxygen and rely on the transfer through. The surface of the water um, but yeah there are other options um, utilizing existing infrastructure and, and setting up like a venturi type system can be extremely cost effective um, you know, I guess generally there's existing pumping infrastructure at, at, at a water storage um, facility and you know relatively cheaply can set up a like a venturi system to to inject some oxygen that way so just a little, thanks ben yep so just a little bit uh, more on that um i have seen a situation where someone was using a pump to fill a tank but they might only use that two or three hours a day and they said well what if we just pump that through use that pump to pump the water back through a fountain in, in, in the, in the dam and I said well there was a four kilowatt motor on this pump I said yeah. it's a, be a pretty expensive um, way of doing it they did it and they did have some improvements in water quality but um, it was it was very expensive to do they, they, they noticed a significant rise in their um, electricity bill so um, you know what sort of comments do you have about um, yeah, looking at what options are there, you've mentioned venturis, but what about the use of fountains? Yeah, so surface aeration is 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 definitely an option as well, and and in the situation where the the dam may be quite shallow, um, certainly that can be can be extremely beneficial. Uh, subsurface units, whilst they are, are the most effective at, at you know transferring oxygen into the water. They can also uh, cause some issues with, you know, disturbing that bottom sediment. Uh, so, yeah, there are some some uh, energy efficient uh, surface aeration units. Um, like you say, you know, a, a four, running a four kilowatt pump for uh, only a few hours starts to add up uh, over time, and then you know, only having it run for that that few hours uh, really, you know, you have to weigh up the the cost benefits of actually running a, running a, a unit like that um, you know compared to a dedicated aerating unit that may be you know half half a kilowatt or 0.75 kilowatt you know and and at maximum say uh, a, a two two kilowatt 
type type motor. So, um, yeah. What about the use of solar PV on these aerators? Yeah, so there are some solar solar options out there. Um, so generally speaking, they're diffuser type systems. Um, like diffusers are, they have, um, uh, let's say they, they, are, they are beneficial. Um, however, they're very uh, targeted in where they're, you know, putting, there's no mixing occurring really with the diffuser system. Uh, so it's very limiting um, in, a, in a large volume storage. Uh, so whilst you're adding some oxygen, which is beneficial, um, we find that uh, you know moving, trying to get more movement into water is more beneficial than that small small amount of oxygen. Um, one of the things that I see with with BEMS, and perhaps you can um, give us your opinion on this, is that in order for the water to be aerated, you've got to virtually pump the whole volume of the dam to expose all the water to, to, to oxygen, whereas with the aerators, um, you're moving water around and you're injecting water, injecting air into that water, so you don't have to move as much water to get a similar effect with an aerator. Yeah, and look, you know, what, we've, what we find, um, or what we generally recommend um, to, to our clients is uh, having, having, you know, particularly uh, you know, in larger storages, having a, a, a system where we target a particular area, and generally that's around the the foot valve or the pickup for you know for the for the nursery, and um, so creating that whole, highly oxygenated area around that that pickup point can be beneficial. So um, the other comment I might would make that while this is a uh, a, a workshop on drought what we're talking about here is something that needs to be done or can be done all the time um, not just wait until you get a, a situation where you have to do something about it yeah um, and and it's 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 like all of these things to do with drought going back to what Kerry said is what we need what a grower needs to do is to have a strategy not wait until they're sucking mud from the bottom of the dam before they decide to do something. Um, try and have good water quality there all the time, which will make um, the, the problems that they might get later on when the level of the dam drops uh, much less. Um, so the same with, with, save, with their water saving. Um, there's no point in waiting until you've got 10% of your water left in the bottom of the dam before you start thinking about uh, all of these other water saving measures. Um, so it's it's very much something that needs to be looked at all the time. Have we got any more questions for Ben? Yeah, Ben, you spoke about beneficial bacteria to add with the aeration and circulation. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Is there a particular one you would recommend? Um, look, I mean, we we uh we have some stuff that we we supply but there are a number of um products out there um i i, I won't i won't go ahead and re recommend one particular product there is there are some that are more labor intensive there are some that are very user friendly that, that come in like a, a water soluble bag or like in a tablet form so you basically just chuck them in, into your dam um but yeah um yeah, there's there's plenty out there. I, I won't recommend any any particular one, but just in general, um, you know, combining the oxygen or aeration with the use of beneficial bacteria can have really good results. So, how do you decide which is the most appropriate biological to add? Uh, generally, we look at a, a water analysis, uh, and we'll we'll sort of determine from there what, uh, you know, what what improvements need to be made. So, you know, generally, like ammonia or nitrogen-based um, reductions, you know, uh, are quite common. So, um, you know, nitrifying bacteria 
you will find in most of the, the products out there, um, you know, for lakes and ponds and things like that. So um, a lot of the bacillus species are quite effective at degrading the organic components in dams. So a lot of the dams have, um, you know, trees lining lining the dams and over, over time, uh, you know, the leaf litter and, and things like that drop into the dam and that slowly builds up and, and starts breaking down, um, releasing more nutrients into the dam. So over time, you know, they can become quite heavily built up with organic material and, and nutrients through runoff from, from the nursery. So putting things in place like the constructed wetlands can be extremely beneficial. Uh, so stripping um, nutrients prior to them entering your water storage and, and also um, you know, utilising some, some beneficial bacteria uh, in, the, in the dam sort of long term um, has benefits. Um, you mentioned um, treatment wet, or flat, floating wetlands or floating yeah. treatment wetlands. Um, it's not something that I've seen um, worked on too much in Australia. There's a little bit of information coming out of the United States, but um, yeah. it's something that we haven't seen much here. Um, yeah, look, there's, it, it's one of those things... Um, <laughs> It, it, it's not a it's it's not the, the the overall solution if you like um uh, i i think you know to to really get effective results the 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 surface area required um uh, is is quite significant and that drives the price uh you know pretty high uh so it, it may be something you know that that you just have in place as a as a uh, you know, mechanism to, to strip part of, of um, you know, capture some solids and strip some nutrients before they enter into the system. But the floating wetlands, from my experience, are pretty pretty expensive. Um, you know, a constructed wetland um, is is pretty pretty basic and, and wouldn't be very difficult, I'd imagine, to um, you know for somebody in the nursery industry to to develop. So. And I guess it's one of those situations that if you don't have somewhere where you can put a constructed wetland, the next yeah. best thing would have a, a, a floating treatment wetland. Yeah. Um, any other questions? So uh, uh, the other probably last thing I'd, I'd mention is uh, chemical application. Um, now it's, it's kind of like a, a last resort quick fix that um, can be a benefit, um, you know, particularly if you've got a, a planktonic algal bloom or something like that, um, where, you know, it's affecting your pumping and, and your irrigations blocking filters or sprinklers or whatever. Um, the use of uh, uh, some form of chemical, whether it be a, uh, an aquatic registered herbicide or, a, or an algicide or something, um, can be a very uh, effective quick fix to to, to kill the algae. It's, it's certainly not a long-term uh, solution. Uh, it's, it's more just to, to get rid of it quickly and then, you know, what needs to be put in place is, is those mechanical devices and, and long-term management using, using beneficial bacteria. So um, these chemicals that you're talking about are, are copper-based? Uh, yeah, algicides are copper-based. Um, so there are a couple of different varieties. There are uh, like copper sulfate-based products, um, and they're also chelated copper-based uh, products. So the difference between the two is the chelated form uh, remains in solution for longer than, than copper sulfate. It tends to precipitate out uh, more quickly. Uh, so the results... Um, uh, are hindered because of that. So uh, chelated forms uh, you find uh, are more effective and, and uh, yeah, depending on the type of algae that's um, targeted, uh, generally there aren't any um, you know, withholding periods or anything like that. Um, you know, if it's like a, a cyanobacteria, a blue-green type algae, then you know, potentially there, there may be some um, withholding. 
Okay. Um, so if we don't have any more questions, I might um, just look at a couple of things here. So um, Ben mentioned um, of, uh, the uh, resources on the NGIQ website. Um, there's a range of videos there on topics that are relevant to drought management, but there's also a lot of other topics. Um, there's, there's technical papers, there's, um, there's links to other websites, there's quite a few videos. So these are um, some of the, the videos that are relevant to, to that. But, um, if you're interested in having a look, this is the uh, the, the uh, website to go to for that for that sort of information. Um, so, if there's no more questions, um, we might bring the workshop to a close. Um, so. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's workshop. Um, I'll be sending out a link with the, um, with the, with the, with the workshop um, to everyone that's attended, so you can have a look at that later on, but it'll also be put up on the NGIQ website. Um, I'd like to um, also just remind you about registering for that um, evaporation project um, that's being run by uh, Eric and, and his team. Um, so if you want to get in touch with any of the speakers, just uh, give me a call, get in touch with me and I can pass on their contact details. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're interested, if you found this a worthwhile exercise to, um, to do, um, let me give, give me some feedback on, on what you thought about the whole process and, um, and topics that you might like to hear of in the future. Um, so I'd also just finally like to thank the speakers for taking the time out to, uh, to, to uh, give their presentations today and, and answer your questions. Uh, it's much appreciated. I think it's been quite a, a worthwhile exercise. Um, so I'd just like to thank the, the speakers again and um, thank all of you for participating and um, I wish you well with all your drought planning. So um, good luck with it all. Thank you. Thanks Lex and everybody well done and um, see you soon. Bye. Thanks Lex. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Lex. Thank you.